everyone, good morning. Hi. It's really exciting to be here with you and love the Israeli vibes over here. Makes me feel uh, homesick. Um, so yeah, Yvette sh shared a little bit about my background, but what I was hoping to do was really to just give you guys kind of a brief overview of some of the things I've done, some of the really important messages I'd like you to walk away with and then just open it up for questions. So the more you guys can ask and really feel comfortable to ask me anything that you have on your mind, the better. So I'm Maya, I'm from Los Angeles. Uh, I was born in Calabasas. If you guys have seen the Kardashians, you then know where I was raised. And I was like the typical valley girl, had an accent, now I don't, I don't know what happened, but I had the whole thing going on in LA and I just felt like this, I felt in high school like this crazy calling for me to go to Israel and to do the military. For me it was just this understanding that I'm born in a time where the Jewish state exists. I'm a Jewish person. I live in a very beautiful kind of bubble in Calabasas and that I have an opportunity to really protect my country. And my country was very clearly the state of Israel. So I moved to Israel. I joined the military. Um, I moved with 26 of my friends, so that definitely helped. We all lived on a kibbutz. They built these little homes and we all lived there. So we were lone soldiers, but we had each other. And I, I was recruited in October of 2008. I was recruited to be a madrichat chir, which is an infantry instructor. And I didn't realize how my life was gonna change. So from, going to the, from being from the Valley of LA, with uh, Malibu 10 minutes from my house and living the good life. All of a sudden they dropped me in the middle of the desert, like in Yerucham, if you even know where that is. They dropped me over there and they just put us in like these, you know, it wasn't fancy, let's just put it like that. Um, and I was only 18 years old. And it's a really crazy thought. And I'm so thankful every day of my life that the military did this to me that they take an 18 year old girl from Calabasas, they drop her in the middle of the desert in Yerucham, and they tell her, okay, here's a tank. We did armored personnel carriers. So it's not exactly a tank, but for the image you need to have in your mind, it's a massive vehicle. It's called Nagmachon Akpadon Kavod Ve'otzma. We're very proud of this, uh, of our beautiful, beautiful tank. And they give you this tank and they tell you as an 18 year old girl, here's the tank. You're now gonna learn every single thing about this tank. You're gonna learn exactly how to take the chain on and off this 60 ton tank. And then the soldiers are gonna come here for a week or two and you're responsible for all these male soldiers and you need to command them and you need to have authority and they need to listen to you. And if they step out of line, you need to put them in place and you're 18, have fun, go. And you really think to yourself, like, am I even capable of this? Like, is this dangerous? Like, what did I get myself into right now? So the answer that the military always gave us, and it was a very indirect answer, which I think is probably the best type of way to give a message when it's indirect, right? A direct message, it's like too obvious, you're maybe suspicious, but when it's an indirect message, it really like hits home. And the message was, obviously we believe you can do it, we put you here. Just go and do it. It's not something to think about. Don't overthink it. You're thinking too much. So I'm, I'm so thankful for that because I don't think as an 18 year old, you can get that experience anywhere. I really think that level of responsibility, it just changes the trajectory of your life and how much you believe in yourself. So at first we, I was doing it on base and it was fine. Everything was calculated. Everything was normal. And then they said, okay, now we need you to go in the field. You need to go to the borders and you need to train them on the borders because they're going to go in and the border of Lebanon is not like what it looks like in Yerucham in the south of Israel. The terrain is very different. It's rocky. It's hilly. They have different things they need to focus on. So then they said, and now you're going alone. We're sending you by yourself to the border of, to the border of Lebanon and you need to train now the soldiers by yourself. You don't have your cute little bubble that feels like summer camp in Yerucham. So then I had probably the greatest growth trajectory of my personal of my personal time in the military because now I was really understanding how much I'm capable to command not only soldiers that were in their actual like, you know, around the same age as me, 
but even their, their commanders. So I was literally working with people that were doing the military for 10, 15 years, and I was literally leading those individuals. So now talking about a 30 year old sitting next to me inside the Nagmachon, inside the Nakpadon, the tank, and now I'm telling a 30 or 40 year old what to do with that person has tremendous experience in the military. So just really understanding how much the, the army empowered me as an 18 year old girl from Calabasas to understand how much I'm capable in my life to lead. No matter how old I am or what my experience is, but just because I have the willpower and I'm willing to do the work. Like I'm willing to do whatever it takes to complete the mission. And that was really the, like my lifetime change. I founded a company in Israel while I was in the military. It was actually very funny. It was, it was a joke. The honest answer is it was literally a joke. We were sitting inside of the cheder ochel, the cafeteria, and the food was disgusting, doesn't matter. We were sitting inside and all of the, I was in a unit with five girls and I was telling them I was the only lone soldier, how much I miss speaking English and how much I miss like hip hop and rap, like how much I miss American humor. I used to show them like American comedians and all the Israelis would be like, Maze, like this is not funny at all. And I was like, I miss that. I miss that so much. Like as much as I love being in Israel, I, I have another identity. I was raised in America. And so I said, you know what? What if we did a party? We did a party targeting all the internationals living in Israel, people that are homesick so that we can show them like we, we exist here, we have our own community and we don't have to feel lonely. So we started these parties and it was so fun because my friend, I'm giving you guys like the behind the scenes answer. This is not what I do on interviews when they ask me about my life. But we, basically my friend, she, her grandpa owned a big warehouse and every time we got out of the military, the five girls, we would go there and we had a deal with her grandpa. If we cleared out his furniture, old Altizachen warehouse, he would let us use the warehouse. This was illegal. Okay. And Malasot, some things you cut corners. Okay. He said he would give us the warehouse to throw a party. So every weekend we went and we would pick up all the furniture and move it and have it sold out. Then we built a bar out of wood and we said, okay, we have a place, we have a bar, we're good to go, let's have a party. And we told all the internationals, like in Israel, we're doing this party, we had like brand ambassadors everywhere. Day of the event comes, 1100 people show up. We can't let anyone in anymore. Like the place is packed, like the bar is moving, like people are just like, let me in, I'm begging you, I'll pay three X the price. Like, I just want to get in there. And we realized like, we hit jackpot like there's obviously a demand here um, and so we actually founded the company like that it was called the international events of the year and we ran the company for five years to the point where we had these crazy luxurious parties at the rooftop of Israeli towers like it became super fancy and we sold the company after five years moved to New York and I'm like okay that's it like I did my thing in Israel, I'm ready to go into the private world and two months later APAC knocks on my door and says, hey, we heard about you through the grapevine and we want you to work for us. We're the pro-Israel lobby of the United States. We lobby the US government to give Israel $3 billion every single year in military aid. That's 30% of Israel's defense budget. And we need people like you that are very proud and not scared to go out there and fight for the cause. So how could I say no? Like I didn't even, I didn't even submit my resume. Like they found me. So I really felt like this was a calling and that my time wasn't done. Like I had to continue giving my time to the state of Israel. So I moved to the Upper East Side and I joined the APAC community and I go into the office like all proud, you know, like here's all my Israel lovers. Like I'm gonna feel really like perfect and at home. And I walk in and everyone's really nice and very Zionistic. But I start to realize something in my first few months at APAC. Like, where are all the Sfaradim? Like, it's very weird. It's like a very, I was raised in an Israeli community in LA. So most of the community is Israeli. They don't call themselves Ashkenazi or Sfaradi. They're all mixed. They're all ha half, half at this point. But in America, we know that there's more of a divide between the Ashkenazim and the Sfaradim. So I only saw Ashkenazim. And I told the APAC, I started telling them, I don't understand, like, where are they? Like. They're very Zionistic, like extremely. It doesn't make sense that they're not here.
and they said, well, we, we don't really know anyone from the Sephardic community. Like our synagogues are separated. We live separate. Our schools are separate. So we have no way to really engage them. So I said, look, I go to Safra Synagogue on the Upper East Side. I, I, I know they're Zionists. Like it's oozing out of them. Like there's no way that they wouldn't want to support the state of Israel. There's no way. And they said, fine, you want to do it. They called it a little project. And they told me, go and do it. Start recruiting people. So I went and I, people were hosting and everything. And then we fast forward about three years later, we have, you know, 500, 600, 700 people who come to policy conference in Washington, DC, and people who are donating millions of dollars to the organization in the name of, uh, of supporting the, the, the state of Israel. Um, so we founded the first ever Sephardic division and now it's grown and I'm sure you see there's a lot of things. So I feel like, okay, I accomplished my next mission. I'm ready to go to business school. For sure, I'm not going to have an Israel thing in business school. Like, they're all capitalists. They just want to make money. They're not going to talk about politics. So I decide to go to business school at Chicago Booth. And I go with my husband. We were both in the same class. And I go to class. I'm like, all right, let's talk about making money. Like, no more Israel. Now we're just talking about business. And slowly I start to see, if you guys use Slack, I hope you do, it's an awesome tool. But on Slack, it's like a messaging uh, platform. I start to see weird messages. And I think to myself, this is interesting. So what happened was uh, one of the people in my class, she decided to lead a PAL trek, a Palestinian trek, where she takes business school students there. But what was on the agenda of the Palestinian trek? So she wrote, Nazareth, Palestine, Haifa, Palestine, Tel Aviv, Palestine. She literally wrote every single place that's not even a question. Like it's totally absurd. Like you need to live in a completely different reality. She wrote those places as a, a like she called it Palestine. So obviously I, I, couldn't, I couldn't just sit there and watch her hijack the narrative because that's all, people have no clue. They have zero clue what's going on over there. So we started to get involved and of course we create a slack war nobody wants to be on a slack war it's like twitter but worse so we start having a slack war and the message is flying back and forth and we realize all the jewish students are writing us but only privately nobody wanted to take a public stance they were all scared that they were going to be labeled that they were going to be attacked, all these things. And it's true, you will be labeled and you will be attacked. So I don't want to create like a false narrative here. But we realized, both my husband and myself, we take very different approaches. He's uh, very confrontational. I'm more like, hey, let's talk, like, I'll, well, let's have a coffee and debate it out. We realized that we have to say something because she was literally winning the hearts and minds of all these people. And I really want to share one thing that happened that's my biggest fear in this country and why you guys, as the Sephardic community, you have to say something. Every person, she was from Pakistan, this girl. Every person that liked her comment was a minority and a woman. Every person that liked my comment was a white male. 60 people liked my comment, they were all white guys. 60 people liked her comment. They were all brown, black, Hispanic women. And it's very, very worrisome because the demographics of this country are also changing. And if we're starting to only have support from one group, we're gonna be in trouble. But what was great about me saying something? My family is Iraqi. What was great about me? That I'm a brown woman and I could break that stigma. And I think that you guys can really, really hone in on the fact that your families, they come from a different background than what people think as Jewish, right? When you say you're Syrian, they definitely, uh, other than your friends and family, they do not think there are any Syrian Jews. When you say you're Lebanese, they don't think that. When you say you're Turkish, they don't think that. When they hear my family's from Baghdad, they're definitely not thinking we're Jewish. And that gave me tremendous power. And I used it, I used that power. I would say it always. So they didn't just put me in the camp of like, oh, she's just another white person saying this. Because that's literally how divided it is right now. So use your power. You have it more than you know, and we're not enough. So we need you guys to speak up. So we ended up saying, you know what? She's leading a pal trek. We're gonna do an I trek. We're gonna do an Israel trek. 
and we did two Israel treks. We did one that was just parties, Tel Aviv, have fun, like one, two days in Jerusalem, like spring break or something. That was one trek. Had 260 people show up. We did another one that was more politics. We went to Israel and then we took them to the United Arab Emirates. We went to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and we took them to Bahrain. And we showed these people, we showed them, look what happens when you make peace with the state of Israel. Look how you prosper as a nation. And we took them on this trek and we had 40 people come. So 300 people from our class went to Israel and her trek had 20 people. And that's how we won the war on the narrative during our time at Chicago Booth. And it's very possible, but you need each other, you need community, and you need to allow yourself to really hone in on what your strengths are, where your selling points are, which is really your personal stories, your family stories that carry an, an enormous amount of weight. So my message to you today, and now I'll open it up for questions after this. My message is stand strong. You have a tremendous story behind you. I see exactly what's going on in the community. I'm, thank God, still very involved. When I saw, for example, the Legends book, I love that book. Like, I literally couldn't put that book down. I tried, it was very big, so I tried to take it in chunks. But the stories, they're so powerful. Like, seeing where people are born and what they went through and what they built in this country. Use that. Use that power, that beautiful connection you have with your family, your grandparents' story. Lift that story up wherever you go, and you'll see that you will change the narrative. You have that power. So with that, I want to open it up for questions, and you can ask me literally anything on your mind from making Aliyah, to doing the military, to moving back, to working for APAC, to campus, whatever you'd like. I have a question. Yes. What would you say was the hardest part of your whole time in Israel, like in the army, drafting, the army, being released, all of that? The hardest time for me in Israel was like the loneliness. I think it's a very real thing and I feel like seeing this community it can be much more because of how strong the community is and how much you guys support each other and you really built like institutions which you don't have when you go to Israel you're thrown in the water and I think the loneliness happens in a when you have like let's say when you go to the bank and everyone's cutting the line and you now need to fight for your place and it drives you crazy and you don't understand why things aren't efficient. Why is the bank only open four hours? No, that makes zero sense, you know? And anyways, you don't even get out in the middle of the week when you're in the military. So you're like, what is this? This is not helpful at all. Um, so those are the moments where you feel like, you know, like you like you get exhausted, you know? You're like, this is so hard. Um, but if you have each other and you have that support, then you really are able to push through it and also learn a new skill set, which is cut the line. <laughs> They're all doing it, just cut the line. You'll learn, it's a great thing to have, don't worry. It might seem barbaric, but it's really not. Everyone's doing it, it's fine, it's socially acceptable. <laughs> How did you and 26 friends move? Like... Yeah, so that's, that's a, I think that's so important because I don't want to minimize like how hard it is to move to Israel. I think we should have really open discussions I know I had a discussion with Ben before he made Aliyah, like not Aliyah yet, soon, but before he moved to Israel to do the military with Shabbat, we sat for like an hour or two on a stair, I remember clearly, and we spoke and I was very open about how difficult a lot of things are because we have a tendency, we're so Zionistic to go there, but when you go and you tell an Israeli that you just moved, they go, what? Lama? Mazet? Like, what were you thinking? They think you're crazy because they understand how hard it is, right? They understand, and that's the part we maybe don't understand so much. So making Aliyah in a group, for me, was so helpful because we had each other to complain to, you know? At the end of the day, you complain, you cry, you curse, whatever, you move forward. So I did something called Garin Sabal, which uh, is basically a group of people. It still exists today. It's a very large organization now, but we had like, uh, bond like one year of bonding before we moved made Aliyah to Israel where we had these retreats and we all got to know each other and we really became a family and then we all moved together and all lived on the kibbutz in little cottages literally next door to each other so we built our own community and that was a game changer so I highly recommend if you want to do that 
I highly recommend at least looking into it and seeing if that's a good option for you and if like having that strong community is important. What gave you the drive from such a early? Yeah, it's a great question. I I think I have like a spiritual answer for it and then like a little more of a practical answer. I'll start with the practical. So I my both my parents, they did the military. So my my mom she did the military. Her family came to Israel from Baghdad in 48, and she did the military in Israel as an Israeli citizen, and she served, she was a, an officer, so she served, served extra time. And my dad, he moved from Romania to Israel, and he served for 10 years in the military, and then he moved to America, and they met in America at a Shabbat dinner. And that's, they got married, I was born here and raised and everything. But I always saw my father, who was in the Air Force, I always saw my father like ready to go to Israel. Like whenever something would happen, he would kind of prep us like, hey, I could be called back and I'm going. Like there's no question if I'm going or not. So seeing that like just as a child, like really seeing what your parents do and how much they love the state of Israel, it just molds you as a person. But at the same time, they didn't raise us in Israel for a reason. They didn't want us to be drafted from a mandatory expect like uh, line. They wanted it to be a choice. So both my sister and I, we made the choice to move to Israel. My sister served in Oketz, which was a, like a canine unit with dogs. Um, she got to keep the dog, if anyone's curious. It's very rare. She got to, I know, see? They know what it takes to take your dog home. Um, so both of us did it, but my brother, for example, it's funny because we're the two girls, but the boy, what they say? Anyways, my brother decided to go be a doctor, and that was his choice, and that's really what my parents wanted for us, to be able to choose. From a spiritual standpoint, I really feel like I, that's what I was born to do. Like, I can't explain it, but since I was young, I always wanted to go to Israel. I always wanted to serve in the military. And the voice just got louder and louder until I told my parents, like, listen, I'm just going to go. No, do college first. Just, I said, no, I'm going to get stuck here. Everyone gets stuck here if they do college. Like, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do the military now because I'm too scared that I'll be too comfortable once I go to, to university. Um, and that's really what, what pushed me to make, to pull the trigger and go. Um, you met your husband here, if you got that? In the military, in Israel. Oh, well. that's what, okay. yes. Did you ever consider like building a family there? I love that question. It's a, it's a sensitive question, that's why I love it. So I'll give you the, the full scope. So my husband, he's from Ecuador. There's 500 Jews in Ecuador. And I met my husband in Israel. So Israel is our Shadchan, which is amazing because we're so Zionistic. Um, so we met there and we lived there and we moved here and we did all these amazing things together. And we always moved here with a purpose. Like the plan to move back to America was very tactical, was like, okay, we want to get our MBAs. Like it was really important for us to go to business school. It opens a tremendous amount of doors. I can't even explain to you how important if you want to succeed like, and not do it through the family route or the community route, it's unbelievable to go to business school. And you guys will have my contact information. Anyone who wants to go ever or knows anyone who wants to go, just tell them to write me. I will explain very clearly why it's important. So we came here for a tactical reason. Go, come to America, start our companies, go to business school, like have more success financially which i think that's really where the struggle can be more in israel and then go back to israel and settle down in israel so that's still the plan we still have very specific goals to hit and we've been checking things off the list but the goal is to go back to israel and and stay there for the rest of our lives okay thank you maya